thank you a lot for joining. So um, uh, to introduce you, uh, so Madame Angela Lyon did, his, did her master at uh, Queen's University. Uh, so inorganic chemist of formation, uh, and she um, is now a patent agent at uh, Queen's University. And um, she will tell us a little bit more about you know, what it takes and uh, uh, the fun of being <laughs> a patent agent. So uh, thank you for joining this uh, circuit uh, lecture. It's highly okay. appreciated. And uh, I look forward to uh, hear what you have to say. Fabulous. Thank you very much to both of you for inviting me. Um, so if it's possible to turn on your camera, I, I love the audience participation of being able to see when you're, you know, understanding what I'm saying or confused or whatever. Uh, but if it's not possible, that's fine. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Um, so I'm going to give a talk that's got sort of two halves. One of the, one of the parts is what it is to be um, a patent agent and what the career is like. And then the other part is understanding more about the whole patent process. I find um, grad students in particular, uh, it's a big benefit to you to have an understanding of the difference between a patent application for example, on your CV or resume, compared to having a journal article. Um, I've heard it said that when you're looking at uh, job opportunities, to have a patent application on your resume is worth about three papers. So it's a good, um, it's a good tutorial for grad students to know about the patent process and to understand what makes something patentable. Okay, let's see if I can get the page to switch. Okay, so what is a patent agent? There's two routes to becoming a patent agent. I am the second one on this slide. The first is doing a bachelor, usually of science, and then going into law school. And so you've got this further three-year law degree, and law usually involves a, a stage or a placement in a law firm where you're specializing and you're getting some work experience. And so if you wanted to be a patent agent, you would typically go into a law firm that has an intellectual property division and you'd get some experience um, working with lawyers who prosecute um, patents or patent agents who write the patent applications and talk back and forth with the examiners. Now, the second one is the one that I did, which is doing grad school either a master's or a PhD, and then you train in the field under a registered patent agent. No matter which of these two routes you choose, you have to face the same professional exam. It's one of those brutal exams that you hear about. You might know somebody who's trying to become an accountant. There's these huge professional exams that people try for, and not everyone passes the barrier and gets uh, the professional accreditation. And that's the case with this exam. It's the pass rate is less than 10%. And um, there's four portions to the exam. Um, it's a four day, four hours per day. And two of the days are about law. And two of the days are more like what it is to be a patent agent, writing a patent application or writing a rebuttal to an examiner's report. And so you can imagine if you did the law school route, you'd be great at two out of the four exams. And if you did the learning to be a patent agent route, you'd be good at the other two. But it's a challenge to become good enough to pass all four portions of that. OK, so I work in a technology transfer office at Queen's. Most universities have a tech transfer office. Um, what do we do there? We help take inventions from the research community and bring them to the public. And we also have a little bit of money from the government to help local startups or our inventors to bring their ideas to market. And the nice thing about that is I get a lot of um, contact with young people, undergrads, for example, about their ideas and we're able to do some searching for them and help them to understand what the next steps are for developing a new idea. So we would 
take a technology um, disclosure and we would do some analysis, like what's the market already? What are the current solutions to that problem? Why is this an, an improvement? We would also look at all of the intellectual property surrounding that idea. Uh, maybe it's already patented. Maybe someone's in a blocking position to you. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. We'll also develop a commercialization strategy, which means should we form a company to develop this or should we just contact, you know, companies that are already working in this area to see if they would like to license the idea. License is basically a fancy word for rent. They pay the university for the rights. The university owns the intellectual property, but they accept the money and um, provide uh, a license so that the rights can be, uh, you know, used by that company that's paying. So you could pay more money and have exclusive rights where you're the only company who gets to use that cure for cancer or whatever the idea is. Or you could pay less and have a non-exclusive license where you don't care if your competitors also have the rights to use it. Uh, you, you know, you can't afford to pay for exclusivity. Patent drafting and filing it all over the world and prosecuting, which means going back and forth with the examiner is um, what my team on the tech transfer office does. We also have venture creation, which is start making new startups. And as I mentioned, licensing. And then I mentioned also that we have some money to help the local innovation ecosystem. Okay, this has got a couple of things for me to flesh out here. And I don't want to go too far. Okay, so these are just some brands for you to realize the impact that intellectual property has on your uh, consumerism. For example, the apple in the bottom left corner, you might go into a store and you would only want to buy products with that symbol on it. You immediately have a good recognition that of that's the company that you want and you have brand loyalty to it. And so of course, they want to have a trademark on a logo like that Apple so that they can mark all of their products and have that consumer recognition uh, working for them. Coca-Cola is an interesting one. If you ever go down to Atlanta, Georgia, you can go to the Coca-Cola Museum and they have quite a bit about how they keep the recipe for Coke secret and that they only allow four individuals on planet Earth to know the recipe and those individuals who are high up in the company are not allowed to travel together in case the plane went down. And so they do a lot of work on trying to keep their recipe secret. And I know we're all chemists and we're all going, what? <laughs> we can just you know, do an analysis. But anyway, it's interesting to see the, the extent that companies go to to try to keep their uh, products uh, under locked under trade secret. Trade secrets we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. They go forever as long as you can keep the secret. Um, patenting is a different route. You have to reveal everything publicly and you get a monopoly in exchange for revealing it. The other thing that's interesting here is Kleenex. Now you might know that brand, but Kleenex's trademark has really become weak. We all call every tissue Kleenex, you know, like, can you pass me a Kleenex? And you don't have any brand appreciation where you would only buy the product from the Kleenex company. And we saw the same thing with jacuzzi. I mean, we're all going into hot tubs calling them jacuzzis, but we don't really care if it's the actual jacuzzi company's product. And so that's not a great thing about um, trademarks sometimes. You, it becomes uh, diluted and people aren't respecting that it's your company's product. So why do you need intellectual property? Well, it helps you to have a lock and a monopoly on the technology. If you come up with a brand new time machine, you don't want to just put it on the web and let everyone produce time machines you want to have a lock on it so that legally people have to pay you for the idea because you're the one who put in the sweat of making this thing and getting it to work. Um, so yeah, there's patents, which we'll talk about quite a bit. 
There's industrial designs, which are a way of protecting the shape of something. You might hear a lot about Samsung and Apple in the courts under their designs for their phones and tablets. There's also copyright, uh, which is, um, you know, the C with a little circle around it. For example, on your thesis, um, first page under the title and everything, you're gonna say, C with a circle, Angela Lyon, comma, 2021. And you're marking it as your work product. And this is only possible for a fairly substantial amount of text. It couldn't be just, you know, like a bumper sticker of, you know, like just do it for Nike. They wouldn't have copyright on just do it. They would have to go forward and trademark that because it's a small amount of words, which is very similar to a symbol. And trademark is available for both of those things. Copyright is for a substantial body of text, and it only counts for that text in that exact order. So you might think, I wrote this story, and my housemate was at a party, and I could hear him telling my story. And you feel like, that was mine. I have legal rights to it. But actually, if it's a copyright situation, your housemate retold that off the top of their head and they didn't use the same words word for word. And so you actually don't have the rights to that. It's only if they had presented the text in that exact order and they pretended it, that it was their own, that's when you could go after them for copyright infringement. So copyrights, you hear a lot about it for songs and poems, also for computer code any time that it's very important that it's those characters in that exact order. Um, so we've talked a bit about trademarks. And the last point here is that it creates a barrier to entry when you have intellectual property. So, you know, your, your next door neighbor sees that you're becoming extremely successful and they want to start selling the same thing as you, but they can't because you have filed for a patent application and you will, if it becomes issued, you will have legal teeth to go after them. So that's a barrier. And the other points on this slide are just showing you how much value some intellectual property has. Nortel, for example, they were surprised to receive four and a half billion dollars for the sale of their patents. And then at the bottom here, Apple won 930 million in a case with Samsung over a design. Oops, I had that last one, which is Google. That's just showing you again that you have brand recognition. Okay, let's talk about Listerine for a minute. So this is a story about a trade secret, which is not a patent at all. It's kind of the opposite of a patent where you keep the secret and you try very hard not to let very many people in your company know the secret of your technology. So when you keep it as a trade secret, you're vulnerable because if an employee becomes disgruntled, they can walk across the street and start working for your competitor. And if they know all the inner workings of your technology, they could reveal the secret. And you don't have a patent on that. You've, you've basically kept it closed down and not published it and kept it secret. And so potentially other people could come up with the same idea and they could file for patent protection and they could end up preventing you from practicing your own technology. I'm not saying that they stole the idea from you and then they patented it, but you know, everyone's looking for solutions to similar problems. Like if you think about curing cancer, there's probably more than one group in the world who's coming close to finding the answer at the same time. And so if you decide to keep it as a trade secret, another person could actually go the patent route and end up being able to block you from practicing your idea. So in 1880, this gentleman came up with a recipe for Listerine mouthwash. And he was a doctor at the time. And you can just imagine in 1880, nobody's brushing their teeth and that uh, you know, being able to kill bacteria in the mouth was a great idea. And he um, approached a company and they licensed it from him and they started producing it and making money and the license agreement is like this long scrolly thing and it says that during the time that the company is using his recipe they will pay a portion of their revenue to either him or his family his heirs after he's deceased 
And basically it didn't say anything about any timeline. It was just while it's for sale, if they're making money on his recipe, they will pay. So you can imagine about, you know, 20 years ago, an accountant at the Listerine company brought forward to the president, why are we continuing to pay this family $15 million a year? The secret came out a long time ago. You know, the regulatory of being able to sell things in pharmacies, we've had to re reveal this recipe, you know, ages and ages ago. It's no longer secret. So why are we continuing to pay them? And of course, the family sued. And the judge looked at the license agreement and basically said, it's no fault of the families that you had to reveal your recipe just to get through all the regulatory process. And you are using this gentleman's recipe and you are continuing to make money. So boom goes the gavel, 15 million continues to this family every year. And so that's an instance where even once the secret was out, it was still so valuable that the, the inventor's um, family is still able to um, see the proceeds of it. Okay, we're going to talk, uh, I already did part of this on this another slide, so we're going to go fairly quickly. There's patents, which we're going to talk more about. Copyrights, you know about, that's the C with a circle for text. Trademarks, small number of words or symbols. Design protection, which is also called design patents. That's the shape of something. And uh, I mentioned the phone. You can also think of it like if you're an artist and you come up with a new design for a vase that can be industrially reproduced and you want to protect that funky shape so that other people can't copy it. The thing with designs are they're not that valuable because people can make a really tiny change to it and they don't owe you any money. It just covers the exact shape. So think of like um, Coca-Cola's bottle, which we can all picture in our mind, you know, like it's symbolic. They don't want their competitor to be able to sell product in the same shape of bottle. And so the design protection is great for that instance. The other two are circuit topographies, three dimensional integrated circuits and how they're laid out can be protected and also new varieties of plants. Okay. So let's say you've got a new idea. Let's say you're at home one night and you hate this stupid can opener and you come up with a fantastic new idea for a can opener. What should you do? Should you phone me up and say, I want a patent application, Angela, let's, let's start uh, incurring the bill? <laughs> no, you should get on the web and do some searching yourself. Most items in a home uh, have been thought of before. And if I were you, I would go to one of these free uh, patent sites like uh, Google Patents or even to the United States Patent and Trademark Office, which is quite user friendly. Their website is great compared to the Canadian one. Um, and you just look to see whether, you know, what's going on with can openers. And you could start with keywords like can and opener. But very quickly, you're going to get to a point where you need to be a bit more sophisticated. You don't want to be limited just to ones that use the words can and opener. You want to look at everything in this category of invention, whether it was translated and the translator didn't use the word can and they didn't use the word opener. And so you would just miss it if you were doing keywords. So you can actually learn to search using classification number. And you could Google it on um, YouTube and take, you know, watch a quick tutorial if you were interested. Classification number is a numerical way of saying which number, like imagine the patent office is full of shoe boxes with index cards and you want to get the shoe box for can openers and see all the different types or the shoe box for shovels where there's ice shovels, sand shovels, steam shovels, all the different kinds of shovels all in one box. That's the kind of numerical system that you want to be able to infiltrate and see all the different ones in the can opener box. The other thing you should think about is have you told your idea to anyone? This will really change whether you can get a patent and what countries you can get it in. So before you rush off to a conference with your fabulous new results, 
think about whether you want to get a patent uh, started on this thing because you should file it before you reveal it publicly. If you reveal it publicly and then you think about patenting, you're going to be limited basically to Canada and the US and you will have lost, you know, Japan and China and all of Europe and Brazil and India, all of those regions, they demand that you take the idea to the patent office first before it goes out into the public. And the last point on here is, is, it, is there a real need? Is there a pull from the industry for this idea? Are there already appropriate ways of solving this problem and they're not expensive and they're okay for the environment and there's no real pull from the industry for your idea. Okay, so we're going to talk about utility patents. That's the kind of patents that I uh, work on every day. So what is a patent? It is an ability to exclude others from practicing your invention. And you may not be able to practice your invention yourself. That's a very confusing idea. So let's think about that for a minute. Let's imagine that you've got, um, you've got one inventor who had the idea for a photocopier and they have a patent on it all over the world. And then you've got a later inventor and they improve upon it. They come up with the color photocopier. It's got everything from the first patented photocopier idea and it's got more. It's got the whole how to do it in color. Can the color photocopier inventor get a patent on their idea? Yes, they can. They can get an exclusive monopoly so that other people cannot make, use, or sell the color photocopier. Could that person sell the color photocopier? No, no, they can't because there's a pre-existing photocopier patent that is blocking them. This person has an exclusive monopoly. You can't sell or make or use photocopiers without paying them money. And so, it's confusing that the color photocopier person can get a patent and yet they cannot sell their thing. Wow, that is weird. But that's how patents work. They aren't giving you the right to make, use, and sell the thing. They are giving you the ability to block others from making, using, or selling it. So, what would the solution be? Well, if I was the color photocopier inventor, I would make a cross licensing agreement with the photocopier guy. I would say, you know, I've got this improvement. What if I give you the rights to use my improvement, but I also want the rights to sell my thing. So I need some, a license to your photocopier intellectual property. And they could make a cross licensing deal where they end up not paying each other anything. Or maybe the photocopier inventor, who has all the power here, says, you can sell color photocopiers, but I want a royalty. I want 25% of every machine that you sell, or something like that. So, yeah, it's confusing that, that you get a patent. I kind of think of it as, um, take, let's take out the complication that the color photocopier person has a new idea. What if they just wanted to sell something that was already patented? Let's say these cell phones that everybody is buying. I want to just start selling them. No, actually, it's my duty to look to see if there are existing patents that are blocking me from doing that. And it's the same thing if you have a patented invention. Just because you have an invention doesn't mean that you don't have a duty to look at what's already out there in the world that could be blocking you. And by blocking, I mean that you've taken everything from their thing and you've got extra stuff too. Okay, that is an exclusive monopoly to make, use, or sell. Now, it's not the whole invention, it's the claimed invention. And we're going to talk more about claims. This is really what you're paying your patent agent or your patent attorney for, which is the last section of your patent application a bunch of single sentences that define what the invention is very clearly. 
and they define it in a way so that it doesn't overlap what's already known in the world. It just talks about what the new idea is. So you might tell your patent agent all this like 60 pages of blah, 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 all about your PhD thesis. But in the end, in the claims that they fight back and forth with the examiner on, you're gonna end up with a monopoly on a certain portion of your idea. That's what your patent's on. And just because you've got all this blah, 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 60 pages in your application, the first part of it, the body of the case, it doesn't mean that you have a patent on every idea in the 60 pages. So you kind of need to pay attention to what the ex patent ex the agent is doing when they fight back and forth with the examiner. They might start with their language being quite broad and the examiner sends references saying, you know, this is already known and this part's already known and you gotta, you gotta crop this thing down to what your actual new idea is. And it's for a limited period of time. Uh, patents are good for 20 years from the time that you apply for it until it expires. And you can imagine when you apply for it, it's gonna sit in the patent office, you know, waiting for the examiner to pick it up for quite a few years. And then they write to me and I write back and then they write to me again and I write back. So, 20 years is not the time that you have the issued patent. It's the entire length of it, whether there's five years as an application and then 15 years as an issued patent. And you cannot sue anyone for infringing you until you get it to be issued. And the last part of this slide is in a specific country. So this is just a reminder that patents are only good in particular countries. So if there's an idea that's patented in the US and you think that it's fabulous, in fact, you would like to just copy it and start selling it in Canada. Well, all you have to do is look in the Canadian Patent Office website and see if there's a corresponding Canadian case. If they didn't bother filing in Canada, then you can make use and sell their idea in Canada. But you couldn't start selling it on the web and, for example, getting customers from the U.S. that you're shipping the product to. Oh, no. The U.S. is where it's patented. And the patent holder could come after you for uh, damages in that situation. Okay. Why should you bother patenting? You can exclude others. We've talked about that. Investment, it's very difficult to get, uh, you know, the sharks on that Shark Tank movie or show or the dragons on Dragon's Den to give their millions of dollars to you if you don't have some kind of monopoly wrapped around your idea. And the last point here is public benefit. Now, sometimes um, you might suggest, Angela, if I've got the cure for cancer, I should just give it to the world. Why should I? try to patent it and make money off of it. I should just blog about it and put it out there, go to the next Chemical Society of Canada conference and announce it to the world. The reality is, is if you had the cure for cancer, a company, a pharmaceutical company would have to invest millions of dollars to get it through all of the phase three clinical trials to make sure that it's safe and effective and all of that. And no one would invest those dollars unless they could have a monopoly and sell that cure for cancer themselves. In fact, if you blogged about it or announced it from the hilltops and didn't protect your idea at all, it's quite possible that it would never come to the public benefit at all, even if it was the cure. Okay. We've talked about this. I just want to introduce the term. Freedom to operate means, is there a previous patent that is in a blocking position to you? So you've got this fantastic new idea for this can opener. You are ready to just start manufacturing and selling, but you have a duty to look at earlier patents to see if anyone's blocking you, like they already have it covered in Canada and the US, this exact way of opening cans that you have also discovered. And so you can't actually start selling. You're going to end up owing them a lot of money. 
Um, yeah, so that's freedom to operate. And it's a type of search. It's kind of two types of search. If you have a new idea, you want to know if it's patentable. So you want to know if it's actually already known in the world. So you're looking at any kind of reference, anything that has to do with this molecule that you're doing your PhD on. But the freedom to operate search is only honing in and looking at patent documents because they want to know if you're in a block, you're blocked from practicing this thing. Not is it already known, but is it an area that you're prevented from working in? Okay. Patentable subject matter. Um, not everything can be in a patent. You I've probably heard of the Harvard mouse and how the Supreme Court of both the US and Canada had lots of fighting about whether this live animal could be a patented subject. And so the law is all about what the words on the page say. And so here's what the words say in the law. Any new and useful art, process, machine, manufacture, or composition of matter or an improvement to one of those things. That is what can be patented. So, you know, things like gravity, which are an idea, it, they don't, it doesn't fall into these. You can't just have sort of a theory of relativity or whatever and get a patent on it. It has to fall within these categories in order to be patentable. Um, an invention must have some kind of um, economic result. It can't just be, look, I made this fabulous compound and I put it on the shelf. I want to patent it. I have no idea what use it is, but man, it's beautiful. Uh, no, it has to have some kind of economic uh, result. So that you'd have to write up some kind of proposal of, of a use for your um, new compound, for example. And the last bullet here is a reminder to me to ask you if you know who has the rights to your ideas. So, um, Leon, you are paying money to, I think, the University of Laval to be a graduate student. Do you happen to know if you own your ideas or if the university owns your ideas? That's a tricky one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, but is, most it, is it possible that, that it could be like a co-ownership of a of both uni the well, university and the, the author? Um, it depends what the agreement says. In your situation, I expect that Laval has a policy about inventorship and that they allow the students and the professors to own their own ideas. I'm guessing that's what the Queen's policy is. We allow you to come to us and propose that the university assumes ownership for it, in which case we get you to transfer it over using a legal document. And the university will take on all the costs to protect it and possibly to commercialize it. And we make you a deal, like we'll transfer 50% of any eventual profits back to the inventor group if you give us the opportunity to advance this. But it's not assumed. It's your option to give it to Queen's University. And I'm assuming Laval is the same. But one thing that you should keep in mind is United States universities are usually different. The institution owns your ideas. And so when you go to the first day of your next job and they give you a whole bunch of paperwork to sign, I would like you to pay attention to the signed, the area about who owns your ideas. Usually the employer will say that if it's in the field that they've hired you for, you're a chemical engineer, they want you working on chemical engineering of blah, blah, blah. And if you have ideas in that area, they want to own the ideas. That's fair. I mean, they're paying you to think about those problems. But it shouldn't say that every single idea while you're in their employ is going to be the employer's property. If you're at home and you're having a baby and you're putting safety stuff all over, you got the toilet lock, you got the fridge lock, and you're a very creative person, so you come up with some cool new ideas. Is your employer going to own those ideas? It's nothing to do with your job. You did it at home. 
that's the kind of thing you want to be aware of. Do you have the right to patent your own ideas or is your employer, for example, the federal government, in which case they own all of your ideas. It doesn't matter what the subject matter is. There's even been a case of a fellow who was in the reserves of the military. So he was in the reserves, right? It was only like one weekend a month. However, all of his ideas are owned by the Canadian government. And that was held up in court. So you have to pay attention when you're signing those documents with your new employer or your new next university, uh, whether you actually have the right to your own ideas um, or not. Okay. Um, so the subject matter we talked about, the claims have to make sense. When I give those single sentences defining the new time machine that you've got, I can't leave out a part. I have to have it actually flow and make sense. Novelty is something you need in order for it to be patentable. That means not known on earth ever before. All of the elements of your invention cannot already exist in one document that's been published. So let's say you're in, I don't know, you're working in aerospace or something and you have a fantastic idea, but it is in existence in Russia in a book that's on the library shelf, and you can prove that no one has ever taken that book off the shelf. So it's not really out there in the world. It's kind of a new idea, but it already exists in the world. No, no patentability. That idea is already known. It's in, in a publication. No patenting. The next thing I want to talk about is obviousness which is, is there a combination of references that we can put together in order to get every element of your idea? And it doesn't just have to be two. I mean, the examiner can take three or four or six papers, put them together and say, ah, this is pretty much the same idea as you. Every element of your idea is represented here. And you might say, but Angela, every invention is an improvement of something. Like you could probably, you know, I often have ideas of putting things together. And so obviousness is something that we sometimes can successfully argue over. We can say back to the examiner, I mean, yes, these two references do bring our ideas together, but no one would ever look in these hugely separate fields for solutions to this problem and bring these things together. So novelty is a major problem. It's like a knife through the heart for a patent uh, pursuit. Obviousness, it's kind of like poison. You might survive, you might get a patent, or you might die. And then the last thing here is utility, that there has to be some kind of use, uh, which is a very low bar. We can usually or, you know, say something to the examiner about usefulness for any idea. Okay, we're gonna talk about timelines. And this is often important in the university setting because people wanna know when they can publish. They don't really wanna get hung up with the patent agent for, you know, six months. <laughs> they want to get their paper. So let's say at the zero month mark, we filed a patent application. Let's say we went into the US uh, using a provisional, which is not formal. It's cheap and there's no rules about what it is. And so that's our first patent application. At the 12 month mark, it, um, you have the opportunity to file the next uh, patent application. So now it becomes formal and it actually gets into the queue for examination and it could actually become a patent one day. At the 18 month mark, your application is going to publish and you might think, well, which one, the first quick and dirty one or the 12 month perfect and all the figures are beautiful uh, formal one? Actually both. Your competitors get to see everything on the web at the 18 month mark. And then between 18 months and hard to say, let's say three years, that's the time when I fight back and forth with the examiner to try to argue why your invention is different than the references that are being cited against us. And the, the inventor helps me with that. And when can you publish? You could publish right after that first filing. It could be the same day, same date, but you don't want to publish before the patent application gets filed. Okay, this one is an international patent application. So if I go back to this 12 month mark, 
you filed formally and you had to sort of choose which countries to go into, US, Canada, oh, maybe Europe, where else do I wanna go? Well, actually, a lot of industrialized countries went ahead and signed a treaty so that if you file one formal application, they'll give you another year and a half before you have to actually show up in their patent office. And that's been very convenient because people need an opportunity to get the funding for the thing, get a prototype made, get some of the testing done. And so this treaty, patent cooperation treaty exists where you can file in one office and uh, have your patent application looked at by an international examiner. And basically it just sits for a year and a half and then you can see at this 30 month mark, two and a half years total, that's when you have to actually choose what countries to go into. So this is a way of making the application longer. I mean, you might think this is crazy. I want my time machine to be patented as fast as possible. But actually, you need time to get the money together, to get the thing made, to get the testing done. And once you hit which countries to go into, you're going to be spending like $50,000 on patent expenses, depending on where you go. And if you can delay that, great. So this zero month mark is where we filed the informal, let's say it was a US provisional. At the 12 month mark, we, instead of going into US and Canada, we decided to go patent cooperation treaty, file in the world office. Then six months later, you get a search report, which is fabulous. The examiner gives you a, a hint of what's going to happen when eventually you're talking to a national patent examiner. At the 18 month mark, you all know it publishes. You have an optional opportunity to write back and say, you know, examiner, you're full of crap. <laughs> These references are completely irrelevant, blah, blah, blah. Why we're different than what's been cited against us. Then at the 28 month mark, they get a report out. Maybe they accepted all of your arguments and they found that you are novel and non-obvious and they think it's gonna go really easy for you once you hit the national patent examiner. And you could show your investors that positive report and say, you know, it's looking really good for us. So national phase entry is where you spend the big money. Europe, India, and Australia give you one extra month. China gives you a second extra month, but pretty much that 30 month mark is a hard deadline. How much does this whole game cost? Getting a search done. And I suggest that it's not just you on Google patents, but you actually have a professional search to see if your idea is already known because there's no use spending thousands of dollars with a patent agent uh, pursuing your dream if you're just going to find out from an examiner that it's already known. Better to invest some money and have a professional search done. And then the actual preparing of the document depends on um, the subject matter. If it's biotechnology, it's going to be expensive. And if it's a mechanical invention, it's probably going to be more on the low end. Prosecution is back and forth. And so you're paying an hourly wage to the agent or lawyer. And the more you give them great ammunition to work with, the easier the job and the less time it will be. And then if it becomes allowed, you have to pay an issue fee to, to each country's patent office to get it to issue. Okay. So a lot of this is what how to get a patent, but it's also what my life is like as in this career. I have hard deadlines all the time. Deadlines where if you miss it by a day, all of the rights have been lost and you could completely get sued for missing the date. And so patent agents need to be super organized about what dates things are due. Personally, I like to get it done before it becomes hairy, but I know a lot of agents who love the adrenaline rush. I mean, if you're one of those people who likes to study all night right before the exam, then you can probably relate to that. Some people really push and they're, you know, flying by the seat of their pants and emailing the document to an associate in Hawaii to get the extra hours before midnight on the day before it gets filed. <laughs> There's all kinds of games you can play. Okay, so here it's a US application. 
So we filed a provisional, then we went into just the US. We didn't want to do PCT, cost about $1,000. The 18 month market published. The first uh, examiner's report came, they cited five references. We had six months to write back. I usually meet with the inventors to hear what they, I like them to compare and contrast the reference. So what's your idea and what does this reference say? And how are they different from each other? And how are they the same as each other? And then um, you write back and then a second um, examiner's report comes. And usually if they cited five references the first time, you will have convinced them on, let's say three out of the five, but they've remained with two. They are not convinced that you are patentable. And so they reassert the same rejections and you have a second opportunity to argue back. But at this point, you need to change your claim. They are solidly convinced that that reference is blocking you. And so you might want to just give in. And instead of having a broad language, like let's say in your claim, you use the word fastener and it meant everything like screws and nails and glue and Velcro and safety pins and everything. But the reference really limits you to just mechanical fasteners. And so you might want to change the language of your claim. Get the examiner to the point where they're happy and you can get the patent issued. Okay. So um, one thing to keep in mind as a patent agent is you need to decide who the correct inventors are of your claims. And of course, you've got a table full of inventors that all have egos and they all think that it was their idea. But legally, you cannot add someone on as an inventor who is not. And you cannot leave someone off who is an inventor. And so this is a touchy thing. You need to probe and figure out who contributed to these ideas that appear in the claims. You know, this claim here talks about warming it to over 85 degrees and using DMF as the solvent. Whose idea was it to, you know, surmount the barrier and get the reaction to work by doing these steps? And the other thing I want to mention is it's possible that you contributed to an invention, but you didn't rise to the level of inventor. So you might be an author on the journal article, but you wouldn't be named as an inventor on the patent application. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're a summer student, undergrad summer student, you're working for the lab. They want you to do a reaction that's well known in the lab. You try it with a new monomer, but you know, they're telling you what to do and it's, it works as expected. Should you be named as an inventor of that new polymer? No, you did what you were told and there was no barrier where you had to give creative input in order to figure the thing out. In another situation, you could be a student who couldn't get this thing to work until finally you decided to switch the solvent, you knew it needed to be more polar, and boom, it worked. Then you would be named as an inventor because your brainwave ended up solving the problem and they couldn't have done it without it. Okay, uh, we're almost, we're getting towards the end. I hope everyone's got coffee. <laughs> I know patent law is pretty dry. Okay, we're gonna look at two patent documents from Philip Jessup's lab, just to familiarize you with these types of documents. The first one, and I want you to look at the top, it's big font, you know, font size 40. What country is this document from? Can you guys turn on, uh, unmute yourselves? I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions. Okay, does anyone know what country this document is from? United States. It sure is. Up at the top, big font, United States. Now here's a question. Is this a patent or is it a patent application? Well, it looks like a patent application. It does. In fact, up at the top, it says patent application publication. 
which is a mouthful, but it's not a patent. It is that 18 month mark where the application publishes and everyone gets to see what you're trying for. It's not a patent. It's basically a wish list. We're trying for this, but it's not through the hoops yet. A uh, couple of things for you to note is the title and the inventor. And it's got an abstract, which is lovely because you don't need to be in the field in order to understand what the idea is. The abstract is just layman's language. So you don't need to be an electrical engineer in order to understand what that patent or application is all about. Now, the other thing to notice is there's no references listed here. And when I go to the next one, which you can see up at the top, you should know is what country is it for and what is it type of document is it? It's a patent and all of the references that were looked at by the examiner are listed. And it looks like not much, but it actually says continued right here. And it's three pages of references. The first three pages of the patents are all the documents the examiner looked at in order to determine if this was a patentable invention. Is it the same? And then, so yeah. is it the same patent? Oh, Actually, okay. no. Okay. This one is about switchable surfactants, and this one is um, switchable hydrophilicity solvents. So I, I, was just, I was just wondering because I'm wondering if you can add or remove um, inventors between the patent application and the final patent. Um, so while it's a pending application, you can make changes to the inventors list. In fact, you need to because some of the claims get dropped. The examiner doesn't allow them and you decide to cancel them. And so the inventorship can change from the first wish list application to what it's actually going to issue as. And um, yeah, so you can add people and you can remove people. Okay. So yeah, I just want you to notice that it says that it's an application publication and there's no references cited. So it clearly hasn't gone through the hoops with the examiner yet. Now for this one, I'd like to take a couple of minutes and walk you through the document. I'm not gonna do all 60 pages of it. I just am giving a sample of what types of sections there are. So this is the switchable hydrophilicity solvents. The abstract tells you what the invention's about. You're allowed to pick one figure in order to put it on the face page. And so we usually try to pick something, um, you know, that people don't have to stare at the graph for an hour in order trying to figure out what the heck is shown there. We just give a flavor for the idea. Then there's a section of all of the figures and you'll notice that this is a NMR. Then you get into the text of the document. The first section is the background. You don't say a lot about background. It's very brief. And then you get into the actual substance of the invention. And this part goes on for quite a few pages. I've just uh, culled it down to three. The first, you start by describing the very broadly, then you go into sort of a middle scope, and then you get down to the very narrow scope. So you might say at first, you know, anything that grabs CO2 out of the mixture and switches its character. And then by the time you're at the narrow scope, you're talking about actual amine molecules that are grabbing the CO2. This is a continuation of the discussion. You're allowed to put some chemistry into the text, but if it was a graph, it would have to be over in the figures. And I included this one to let you know that there's an experimental section at the end. It's interesting. So you talk about your invention in broad terms, but you also have to give exactly what you did. So you can imagine, let's say somebody came up with, I don't know, like a time machine and they couldn't figure out how to reproduce it. The most valuable part of that invention document would be what did they do? You know, you want to try to reproduce exactly the conditions that they had. And so you can't just hand wave broadly of like, it could be this solvent, it could be that solvent, it could be this temperature. No, in addition to hand waving, you have to say what you actually did. How much did you weigh out? What temperature? What was the you know, conditions of the reaction, how long did you let it go for, and all the characterization of the compounds. 
And at the last part, we have the claims. And here it says a composition that includes water or aqueous. It's got dissolved CO2 and it's got bitumen, which is, uh, you know, like a really thick, horrible crude oil product. And then your switchable hydrophilicity solvent. And then at the end, it gives in a wherein clause, uh, wherein it sort of ties together what you're trying to do and saying, you know, we're in the composition provided, blah, blah, blah. So um, this is a very typical format for a chemistry claim. And then down here at number nine, we switch and we're no longer trying to claim a composition. Now we're going for a method. A method is a series of steps. So it's harder to get people to pay you money for a series of steps that they own. It's much better to have a uh, patent on an actual product that they are going to sell and they pay you money that goes back to the inventors for the rights to use that composition. Okay, I think this is my last slide and I'm open to any questions after this one. Um, <clears throat> so the patent agent works closely with the inventors. I would say one of the um, typical things I do is being on top of all of my deadlines. So I'll know all of my hard deadlines for the coming weeks and I'll have to plan my time accordingly. Uh, I use my day, certain blocks of time are short tasks. Mm -hmm. And then also I wanna have deep think, no interruption time. Um, because you know there's times where you have to really figure out what the examiner is saying and trying to understand what the inventor is giving you and putting it into words in the page to clearly articulate what the difference is. Sometimes I'm meeting with inventors um, and then I also oversee a uh, legal secretary when she's doing uh, submissions to the patent office. Uh, we have errors and omissions insurance on the agent and so we have to oversee the staff so that it's all on the agent's head whether the right thing went in by the right deadline. Yeah, so I'm going to take off the share and I'd be happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. Thank you. Um, I have a few questions. <laughs> Usually sure. students are shy to stop. Uh, so I'll start with, uh, I have actually two questions. Um, you were saying that, you know, let's say you don't patent first someone who works for you, leave the company, decide to patent things themselves. Yeah, How yeah. can they get the patent if it's not novel, since a company is working on that? So the thing that's standing in their way is anything that's published. So if the first company has kept it under lock and key, and it's not a publication, they could potentially get a patent. Now you're sort of mixing the world of, is it fraud? Are they fraud in, you know, fraudulently pretending that they're the inventor? They can get in legal trouble for that. But let's, let's separate the situation. Let's say a second company, not, an, not a disgruntled employee, but just another company who was also working in the area came up with the same idea as you and they patented it. And you had been doing this for years, but never published. They could block you. Is they a lab can get a patent. Is a lab book a publication? Um, it depends what you're talking about. Like I'm using the situation of you were doing it in the company, but it wasn't published. Because like I heard that if you write your uh, lab book, have it signed and dated that can be used to confirm when you made the invention in case there is a claim. So okay. what is that's the slightly let me, let's talk about that. So in the US, up until Obama made a big change in 2013 or 16, I think it was 13. Anyway, previously the US had this way of doing it where they wanted to know who invented it first. Not who got to the patent office first, but who actually has lab books dated so that they came up with the idea first. Anytime there were two applicants for the same idea, there would be this huge legal battle where they had to take the lab books and prove the date. 
And so that's not a situation where the lab book could be cited against somebody as a publication, but it is used as proof and often companies in particular want your lab book to be signed and dated, not only by the author, but having someone else in the lab say read and understood by and signing the bottom of every page. I've worked in academic labs where we had to have that. And then the law changed in the US so that it caught up with the rest of the industrialized world, which decided a long time ago, whoever gets to the patent office first, that's who gets the rights. We're not doing these huge legal battles to figure out who actually invented the idea first. Okay, so so that's why there are still, like I think CRISPRs, there were some battles about that and also Grubbs Catalyst. It was a question who, who went to the patent office first. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have another question. You, you, you said it's a dry uh, topic, but you brought it quite, um, and it was very interesting to listen to you. Um, so when, one thing that also bothers me is where to apply for a patent. And you, you said that if, you know, there's a U.S. patent, you do this thing in Canada and try to sell it to the U.S., you know, you could be sued. Um, what about the opposite? Like, if someone patented the things in the U.S., but you're the neighbor and said, okay, it's just in the U.S., I will make it in the U.S. and sell it elsewhere in the world. Is it still mm -hmm. infringement? Well, it depends um, because the the law says make, use, or sell. So okay, they couldn't so. make it in the U.S. and ship it elsewhere. They would have to do their manufacturing outside of the U.S. Okay, so but could they do that? Could they make it in China and sell it in, you know, Alibaba all over the world, but not in the U.S.? Yes, if the patent is U.S. only, they are not prevented from doing that. Okay. Okay. Um, is there any question by? Uh... I do have one. Uh, yeah. From the previous example that you gave about about the, the printer and uh, having a, a a previous patent holder uh, have the the yeah. the privileges. Uh, how uh, would uh, that would be tackled? Uh, in case of, uh, for example, okay, I made uh, the color printer, but I saw that uh, the previous uh, model printer model has a patent holder, and so if I do any any changes to the model of a, of the printer itself, uh, okay, does that still apply? Uh, even if it, even if it doesn't change the fun functionality of the printer, it still prints the same. Uh, right. kind of the same the same way it just uses different piece, pieces or a different mechanism for for printing would that still apply for the for the the previous patent holder or, or is that a whole new patent uh, in itself um okay so I'm going to try to answer and you let me know if if I make it or not if if there's a previous patent that you fear is blocking you, you have to do kind of a deep dive into what the claims say. And if, let's say the claim talks about this photocopier or printer, and it lists four essential items, like, you know, a printer, wherein it's got this component, this component, this component, and this component. If you can make yours and eliminate one of those, then you will not be infringing their claim because their claim said all four of those components had to be present. Your problem will be if you take everything that they claim and you add an extra thing like color, then they're blocking you. You're doing what they've claimed. They said it would have these four components and it does, and it's got extra stuff too, but that doesn't matter. Um, so, you end up doing an analysis of what are they claiming? Not just the 50 pages of blah, 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 where they talk all about their invention, 
but what the actual patent claims say of the ish patent after the fighting with the examiner. Those are the ones that have legal teeth to come after you. And so you have to look carefully at every word and see if there's a part of it that you can eliminate in order to get yourself out of trouble. Alternatively, you could license the rights. So you, you could fix the, the problem with money. You know, they're blocking you, but they're happy to take a royalty and, and you want to get started selling. And so you give up, I don't know, 10% of what you're um, making in order to gain the rights. Okay. Uh, another question that I had um, was it that, uh, was it about, about licensing? Yes, uh, a bit about the, uh, about uh, uh, so uh, you mentioned uh, for example that most employ employers will have their contract to hold uh, uh, to basically be owners of all the ideas in the area that you work. Uh, yeah. Is that is that uh, the case that is basically okay? It's something set set in stone, or are there employers that okay we will. Uh, well, well, is that is that something that that is just uh, has always is been that way, or is that there, or are there employers that are thinking of maybe maybe we can uh, work or some uh, in another way, maybe give uh, talk about the sharing sharing ownership or something like that, or a kind of deal uh, with our employees so that as a as a kind of incentive for people to be creative and inventive mm -hmm. in the market. Yeah, I mean, as an employer, you want creative people. And so you might want to be quite flexible on the language. You want to own the ideas that you're employing them to consider, right? They're trying to fix, I don't know, global warming or whatever. You want to own the ideas that you're employing them for. But you may not want to hold them back if they're inventing things at home on different subject matter. Because you love creative people, you don't want them to be turned off of uh, being hired by your company. And so this is one incentive to them that you're not going to claim ownership on all of their ideas. And most employers don't. They want the subject matter that you're employed for, and that's it. But you have to kind of watch the language. I find sometimes they put in this blanket statement about how they'll own all of your ideas while you're under their employ. And if it was me, I would push back saying, you know, I want, you know, in the subject matter of chemical, you know, engineering or whatever. And then you check with them and they're like, oh yeah, that's fine. That's what we meant. And then you both initial the change and you're not willing to sign the agreement until the change is made. Like you're not, you know, I, if it was me, I would push back, but I'm warning you that if you're working for the federal government, then you are not going to be able to fight. They will own all of your ideas. Okay. Um, oh, thank you. Another question. Um, the difference between trademark and copyright, you know, I know yep. one is a text, another is just a smaller content, but yep. what are the legal consequences of in, like infringing in the copyright or trademark? Like, right. let's say I take just do it and put it on a t-shirt, right? So versus copying a thesis, like what, what are the the legal consequences of each? Right. So when they have a trademark on, I don't know, a symbol or a just do it or whatever, um, a lot of times the companies will pursue, like they will come after you. They want their symbol to be their company only and for there not to be any confusion. And so if they've invested in trademark, you're probably going to get a cease and desist letter if you're taking their trademark and using it for your brand. Now, copyright infringement, there's tons of lawsuits in the area of music, right? For, or even J.K. Rowling was, you know, sued for 
some author who believed that she had taken a portion of their book and rolled it into the first Harry Potter. There's a lot of artistic lawsuits about copyright. Oftentimes, you get ready for copyright protect, like you label your thing as copyright, but you're not really looking all over the world for people who have lifted passages of your text. And so I would say there's a lot less lawsuits happening in the world of copyright when it comes down to, you know, people who've taken a part of and put it on their website. It's hard. It's hard for people like photo photographers, you know, they, you often see the watermark put right across their picture on the web because they don't want people lifting it and using it without paying them for their copyright. Um, I don't know if that helps, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So a company has to pay for a trademark. Yes not for copyright copyright you can just label it with the c and the circle around it and that's it you don't need to fill out a form and send money to the government okay so so one is a company decide that's mine and nobody touched it so i'm paying for that yeah and it does take time to get the trademark applied for and approved and it's per country and so you can imagine people like, you know, McDonald's with the golden arches, they're paying for that all over the world for trademark okay. protection. So, and last question, <laughs> it, it, it's small details, but could I have Einstein decided to trademark is E equal MC square? Like, mm. let's say someone makes an invention, uh, 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 discovery as important, like managed to have all forces yeah. in one theory can that person if they know it will become the most popular formula ever decide to trademark it even if it's from uh, natural i don't know i'm not sure if i know the answer to that i know there's some rules like you're not allowed to um, trademark names like you can't trademark the name jesus there's a lot of jesus's in the world and you're just not allowed um but I'm not sure I know about E equals MC squared and whether you could do it. Also, I know in Europe, there's um, if they think that the thing that you're trying to trademark describes how the thing works, then they won't allow it. Like it's, it needs to be just innocuous and not important to describing how the thing works. And so they've got a lot of rules about what you can trademark. Okay, so um, could, but I'm not sure about chemical formula or mathematical formulas. <laughs> yeah. I'll have so to you, ask my trademark guy and uh, <laughs> get back to you. So, like, you cannot trademark a color printer called color printer. Uh, the the name color printer. I think if it's already known in the like, it has to be something where you've got a monopoly in your field. Trademark is dependent on what field of business you're in. So for example, you could have, uh, if you think about Canadian advertising, there's a breakfast cereal with Tony the Tiger, and then there's also one of the oil and gas companies where it's a tiger. And you're like, well, why, you know, it's the same Canada. Why do we still have these tigers? And it's because the field of business is different. Um, so, what was your question again? Like you say that uh, trademark should not be too descriptive. Like a company decide to put in a market a color printer and they call it color right. printer and they trade it. I guess. Yeah. So the word already has meaning and it's used. It would be better if they came up with a word like jacuzzi, which is you know never before known. Okay or Xerox or some, you know, combination of letters that they created that isn't already known, then they would be much more successful um, in a trademark pursuit. Okay, I see. So uh, are there any other questions? Well, if not, I would like to thank you very much for this very informative and interesting talk. And uh, very well. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm sure everyone learned a lot today. So be careful about what you publish if you want to patent something. <laughs> yeah. So thank you all for joining and uh, have a nice holidays. Thank you.